This video has been sponsored by Displate. I've been doing YouTube now for about six and a half years, but in the last few years, it's grown at a pretty crazy rate. When I first started, I was just in my parents' garage, and I pretty much had nothing. I remember that it was a struggle to get even basic chemicals and glassware. Now though, I have this office that I work in, and I also have this entire lab that I built with my dad. And when I think about it, it's almost unbelievable. I mean, I have things like real chemical storage cabinets, you know, equipment like gas cylinders. Uh, I have a fume hood, or actually two fume hoods, which are slightly better than what I used to have, which was just a fan and an open garage door. I also have a drawer almost exclusively for hammers and another drawer just for blow torches. And when I think about all of this, I am super happy with how things are and I'm really thankful for all the support and everything that I've gotten over the years, but I can't help but kind of miss how bad it was. Like I said before, I used to do everything in my parents' garage and it was far from ideal to say the least. I filmed all my projects on one table and there was barely any space for anything else. I almost didn't even have space for a camera stand and everything was so crammed. I did my best to organize it and to be safe, but it was still undeniably some sort of hazard. However, I found that the added danger factor was kind of fun and exciting. The chemistry itself was challenging and dangerous enough, but I think I liked the bonus that my terrible setup added. It made everything that I did much more difficult, and I had to be way more precise and careful. This made many of my projects a lot more nerve-wracking and high stakes, but I think it also made them significantly more exciting. Now though, it's much more official. I pay rent for my own space, and I have my brother and my friend working with me. I mean, it's way safer and still a lot of fun, and I'm able to do some higher end stuff that I never even dreamed of. However, I've been feeling that there's a part of me that misses that struggle and that danger. So what I've been wanting to do for a while is go back and do some chemistry in my parents' garage. I've been really wanting to relive how things were and to see if I actually miss it. I didn't just want to do any random project though, and I specifically wanted to make bromine. Bromine's an element that's similar to chlorine, and it's a very angry, blood-red liquid. It's also one of my favorite elements, but that isn't the only reason that I wanted to make it. It's because it was one of my first garage projects that I felt was really pushing the boundary of safety. It has always stuck out in my mind as the first video that I really started to challenge myself and to push the limit of what I could do at home. I remember preparing for ages to make sure that I could handle everything and anything that could go wrong. I also remember some of my chemist friends telling me that I was going to die doing it. But anyway, now to get started, the first thing that I had to do was ask my dad for permission to use the garage. I have a question to ask you. Mm -hmm. Can we use the garage sometime this week <laughs> to make some bromine? You need just like a verbal contract or something? I, I'm, there's nothing in the garage is totally flexible all week. To make bromine? Yes. Okay. Okay. I mean, <laughs> That's it? <laughs> not a nuclear weapon, I'm fine. With that out of the way, I started putting together a little chemistry kit that I could take home. To know exactly what I needed, I just rewatched my old bromine video and I did my best not to forget anything. Based on what I saw, this seemed about right and it was mostly just basic glassware and equipment. Some of it, like the funnels, the condenser, and the stands, were actually the exact same ones that I used in the original video. Now for the chemicals, the main ones that I needed were muriatic acid, sodium bromide solution, and chlorine pool tablets. I originally bought all of these at my local hardware store, and I figured I could just get them there again. When I went to go buy them though, they only had the acid and the pool tablets. 
they'd apparently stopped selling the sodium bromide years ago, which I think might be good because we don't need more people making bromine in their garage. However, this did make me a bit sad, and I started worrying that this project wouldn't be possible, or at least possible in the way that I wanted to do it. But luckily, after searching my lab for a while, I actually found the sodium bromide that I had used in the original video. It was super old and only half full, but I figured that it would still be okay. Now, with all the chemicals and equipment, I took the 40 minute drive back to the garage. The moment I walked in though, I remembered exactly why I left. <sighs> Sucks. Okay, that's a start. Oh god. Okay. I don't know what to say. <laughs> I, uh... I don't feel good about this. It was even more cluttered and worse than I remembered. But either way, the first thing that I had to do was clear the table. This ended up being a lot easier than I thought, and there wasn't actually very much to move. The hardest part was finding somewhere to put everything, and I ended up just shoving things wherever they would fit. Okay. With the table open, it was more or less good to go, but I wanted to see if I could find something to cover it. I spent a few minutes looking around the room, and I was very surprised to find my old glass tabletop. For most of my time in the garage though, I actually used a different one that came from my grandma's old table. However, in 2017, that one exploded from an accidental lithium fire, and I replaced it with this one. It was just a cheap tabletop from Ikea, but what was kind of funny was that for years, I thought that it had a zebra pattern. I also called it a zebra pattern at least a few times while setting it up, and my friend couldn't help but say something. It's also a fingerprint, not a zebra. Oh. <laughs> I, I thought it was a zebra thing. It definitely looks a lot more like a fingerprint <laughs> now that I look at it. I think it was even called fingerprint tabletop. Either way, good to go. Now with a completely clear and covered table, I was ready to start doing some chemistry. In my later garage videos, I filmed from the side that was closer to the bench, and I attached a backdrop to the garage door track thing. In the beginning though, when I made the bromine video, I wasn't nearly as advanced, and I filmed everything from the other side. I'm not exactly sure why I did it like that, because there was definitely less space on that side, and I think it was just because I liked the workbench background. But either way, I decided that I had to do it just like I did in the original video, and I started putting things together. Awesome. What was sad though, was that after not even five minutes, I was already starting to get a bit frustrated. In my normal videos, I kind of obsess about having everything clean and proper, and that just wasn't happening here. The background's gonna be this garage, Everything's gonna be crooked. I'm gonna be doing stuff out of mop buckets. I don't know why I'm trying so hard to make it look nice. Oh well, no, no, no. The point of this is to just, to relive what it was and I should just, I should, I should enjoy it. Here we go. Amazing. With both my stands in place, I attached a large flask to one of them. What I had to do next involved concentrated sulfuric acid, so it was time to put on my lab coat and goggles. Up until now, I think most of what I had felt was just annoyance, but after getting geared up, I started getting hit with that sense of danger. It feels very, now it feels very inappropriate to be in a lab coat and goggles in this garage. It doesn't feel illegal or too sketchy actually. It just, it just feels dangerous. I don't even have a running tap around here. So if I spill any of this acid on me, what do I do? I, I mean, I, I can run to the tap down there, but it's just over 24 obstacles. 
What I had to do now was put together the rest of the setup, and I had to seal every joint with the sulfuric acid. This would prevent any bromine that I made from leaking out, and I couldn't use regular grease because the bromine would just instantly react with it. After I had covered most of it, I wiped off the lower part with a paper towel, and I dropped it into the flask. I then added a three-way adapter and an addition funnel, along with a thermometer and a condenser. To the other end of the condenser, I attached a smaller flask, and this was where I'd be collecting all the bromine. Now with all this glassware in place, the main part of the setup was done. So far it's not as bad as I thought it would be. Just safety-wise it's awful still. But we also haven't started anything, so... Uh, I guess we'll see. There still might be a disaster. Now the next thing that I had to do was weigh out some of the pool tablets. To do that though, I needed a scale, and I had totally forgotten one. But thankfully, that wasn't a problem, because earlier, when I was just looking around the garage, I happened to find one. We have a high quality scale right here. Uh... <laughs> it's broken. <laughs> it's just permanent- oh, maybe it's not broken. <gasps> it works! I don't know if I'll trust it. Uh... I mean, it's all we have. But anyway, with this hopefully accurate scale, I had to weigh out about 75 grams of the tablets, which were made of something called TCCA. It turned out that each pellet was almost exactly 15 grams, and I ended up only needing 5 of them. This was very convenient when it came to weighing them out, but in this large puck form, it would be impossible to get them in the flask. So, I was going to have to turn them into a powder. When it looked good enough, I found some scissors that I last used when I was like 6, and I cut off part of the bag. I then went back to the large flask, swapped out one of the stoppers for a funnel, and dropped in a stir bar. On top of this, I then dumped in all the powdered TCCA. After that, I added 30 mils of water to a beaker, along with another 30 mils of the muriatic acid. This was all added to the addition funnel, and I sealed it with another glass stopper and some sulfuric acid. The next thing to do was to add a hot plate, and unlike the original video, I also included a container. This container was very important in terms of safety, just in case the flask broke or started leaking or something. It still wasn't the most ideal setup, but at least now, if some sort of catastrophe happened, it would at least be somewhat contained. Now under the other flask, I added a bowl, and I filled it with ice. This would help keep the bromine cool, and it would reduce how much angry vapor it let off. There would still be some vapor that managed to escape out this part here though, and I had to put together an inverted funnel trap. To do this, I basically just connected a tube to a funnel and hovered that in a beaker. I then got another beaker, and I had to add something called sodium thiosulfate. I want to have a little power supply, but I forgot that the... I, I can live without it. Whatever. You forgot the oper this operation? I forgot there was an operation going on. <laughs> this thiosulfate is really good at neutralizing bromine, and I just had to dissolve a bunch of it in some water. It took a while because they were all big crystals, but they did eventually all disappear. After that, I poured it into the inverted funnel trap, and I brought it up until it was just above the funnel. With this setup, there shouldn't be any bromine vapors that are able to get out, and I'll talk more about how it all works later. Now as another quick point of safety, I also mixed up a bunch of extra sodium thiosulfate solution. 
It was very important to do this, just in case I had any accidental spills or splashes. If any bromine ended up somewhere it shouldn't have been, I had to be able to destroy it as quickly as possible. Now at this point, I thought that I was good to go, but then I realized I completely forgot about the water for the condenser. To make this happen, I first had to fill a mop bucket with some hose water. I then dropped in a small water recirculator, which is usually meant for a pond or a fountain. After that, I brought it back into the garage, connected the tubing to the condenser, and I plugged it in. I was expecting water to immediately start rushing through the condenser, but nothing happened, and it was apparently broken. I wasn't too surprised by this though, because it was the same pump that I'd used in the original video, which meant that it was super old. I kind of thought that this might happen, so just in case I'd bought a new one, and I quickly swapped it out. This time when I plugged it in, it worked, but the water was moving way too quickly, and I was a bit worried that the tubing might pop itself off. I feel like there's way too much pressure in that for no reason. Hopefully one of the tubes don't just fly off. After all this, the setup was finally ready, and everything was more or less good to go. So this is the moment to make the bromine. I feel a bit anxious. I'll admit it. When I felt that I was ready, I started pouring in 400 mils of that sodium bromide pool solution. The moment that it touched the TCCA, it started turning yellow, and I think this was because bromine was forming. I'm not exactly sure what the reaction is, but I think somehow the chlorine in the TCCA was swapping with the bromine in the sodium bromide. If this were happening, it could be turning it into sodium chloride and releasing bromine. I then turned on the stirring, and I let it sit there for a few minutes. When I felt that it all looked okay, I opened the funnel with the acid in it, and I let it slowly drip in. This caused it to start getting even darker, and this was because a lot more bromine was being made. Unlike the other reaction, this one was very well known, and the acid was reacting with the TCCA and releasing chlorine gas. This chlorine gas was then reacting with the sodium bromide to make sodium chloride and bromine. After all the acid was added, I let it stir for a few minutes, and I took away the funnel. I also filled the bucket with a bunch of ice, and I cranked up the hot plate. Now, I basically just had to wait. I should mention though, that this method of heating the flask with an open hot plate wasn't exactly ideal. I mean, it's okay and it does work, but it's much better to use something else, like a heating mantle. I just did it this way because again, it was how I did it before, when I didn't have any equipment. As it warmed up, it didn't get that much darker, but it was slowly climbing out of the flask. I also started seeing it at the beginning of the condenser, and I eventually started collecting some blood red liquid. This was all bromine, and from this point on, it was usually pretty steady state. It was mostly just a matter of waiting for all the bromine to make it over. This would take at least a few hours though, and I decided to use some of the time to ask my parents a few questions that I'd somehow never asked. Good lord, what's happening? It's, it's excellent. I uh, applaud the effort. It's funny this is science. This is science, everyone. What did you think was going to be the outcome of donating the desk? Um, I haven't, I didn't have an outcome. Um, you thought it was just indefinitely going to be? It was just a hobby. I, I didn't, I couldn't tell. I, you know. I mean, you were a chemistry student. I figured, you know, if you were a musician, you'd be playing music or, <laughs> or uh, a football player, you'd be exercising. So I figured it was just part of the, the ritual of, uh, of, of being that. I knew that possibly being interrogated as having a meth lab might be on the... Because when the door is open and the neighbors are looking in, what else can they conclude? Okay, that's excellent. Thank that's you. It. Carry on. What, what did you think when I first started doing this in the garage? It was interesting. 
<laughs> That's it? <laughs> Were you ever scared? Were you ever, like, thinking that it was dangerous? Maybe. <laughs> did you ever- did you ever have fears that there would be a disaster? No, I had fears that we might be get, all getting poisoned. <laughs> <laughs> Slowly. Slowly. Uh, but, yeah, so you were never afraid when you saw something like that? No. Why? Because I thought you had it under control. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, it, was, it was all under control. I trusted you. But what happens if I just had too much confidence in myself? Then we'd all die. But anyway, now back to the bromine. As I kept distilling it, the flask slowly cleared up, and it gradually looked less and less scary. I then looked over at the other flask, and I had a decent amount of bromine. There was also a bunch of water in there, though, that had come over as well, but it was just really hard to see. Also, up until now, I hadn't smelled any bromine, and when I looked at the trap, I could tell that it was working hard. It was now completely white because of sulfur, which was being released, as the bromine reacted with the thiosulfate. Eventually, after a total of about 7 hours, it was looking pretty good, and even the condenser was becoming colorless. At this point, there was probably still some bromine left, but it just wasn't worth waiting for it. So, I decided to end it here, and I turned off the hot plate. I then left it there for a couple hours, to cool down to room temperature. When I came back to it, the flask was colored again, which meant that there was definitely still some bromine in there. But either way, now that it was back to room temperature, it was safe to take apart, and I started by pulling out the thermometer. I then shot in some water to wash out any residual bromine that might have been in the adapter or the condenser. With this all clean, I was able to pop it apart, and then I moved on to the other side. I started by removing the trap, and then I got rid of everything else. Now taking a closer look at what I had, it was actually about half water. It was a little bit hard to see, but almost all of this water was floating as a layer above the bromine. This was happening because bromine and water don't mix very well, and bromine is also over three times denser. Up until now, the bromine had been clamped to this stand, and had been either partially sealed by the distillation setup, or completely sealed by a stopper. So, while making it was still definitely dangerous, it wasn't terrible. The real dangerous and scary part was what I had to do next to get rid of the water. I was going to have to pour it, and bromine just loves vaporizing, which meant that I was going to be making a lot of fumes. Also, handling it in general meant that there was a risk of dropping it, which would be a catastrophic disaster. <laughs> That'd actually be a huge disaster. As a basic safety precaution, I was going to be doing everything over a plastic container so that any disaster could at least be somewhat contained. Just in case, I also mixed up even more sodium thiosulfate solution, which I figured I could throw on the bromine, before running out of the room. When I felt that I was ready, I got out my respirator, because I no longer had the luxury of a fume hood. I also opened the garage, and I turned on the fan that I used to use, which I was honestly surprised was still there. With the mask on and the fan going, I was pretty much good to go. The only thing that I was still missing was a face shield, but I didn't bring one. That wasn't a huge problem though, and I'd just have to be even more careful and not let any of it splash. When I transferred everything to a separatory funnel, I washed things down with some distilled water. The lower, almost black, bromine layer was then drained directly into a smaller separatory funnel. Now, what I had to do next, was the worst part. Even though there wasn't any visible water left, there was still a small amount dissolved in the bromine that I had to get rid of. To do this, I had to add some concentrated sulfuric acid, which wouldn't mix with the bromine, but it loves to pull and hold onto water. 
The danger here is that if there were a lot of water left, it could cause the sulfuric acid to heat up enough that it could boil the bromine. So I added it very carefully, and it turned out to be okay. However, the boiling risk wasn't quite over yet, because like with the water, it doesn't mix very well with the bromine. It was just floating on top of it, and I was going to have to shake it. And in case it wasn't already obvious, shaking a mixture of sulfuric acid and bromine isn't exactly the safest thing to do. Also, it was possible that there was still a decent amount of water left, which could cause things to heat up, build some pressure, pop out the stopper, and spill bromine everywhere. That exact accident actually happened to me once, but it was thankfully with something that wasn't dangerous. To prevent this, I had to make sure that I vented it often and quickly by opening the valve. Another added danger was something that didn't really have anything to do with chemistry. It's something that you can't really tell from the videos, but to make it look nice, I often have to awkwardly reach over and around the camera. In my entire time filming chemistry, I've never really had a major accident because of this, but it definitely increases the risk. Thankfully though, this wasn't the day for a disaster, and it all went okay. Now as we saw before, bromine is very angry, and it likes to build up pressure. It's not so much that it would crack the container that it's in, but it's bad, because it really likes to push itself out of everything. When it escapes, it then reacts with everything around it, and it turns it all rusty and crusty. The only way to really tame it is to completely seal it in a glass ampule. To do this, I had to make one using a big test tube and a blowtorch. I heated it until it got nice and gooey, and then I pulled it to thin it out. After waiting about 10 minutes for it to cool down, I started draining the bromine into it. The ventilator makes so much noise. So I felt my breath. <laughs> with it now safely in the ampule, I blasted it again with the blowtorch, and as I pulled away the top part, the glass sealed itself. When I looked at it closer, it seemed like it was completely sealed, but I had to wait for it to cool down to room temperature before actually testing it. One of the biggest mistakes someone can make is making the ampule and then testing it right away. You have to wait till it's like completely cooled, otherwise <laughs> flip it over, boils. Poof. When I came back about 10 minutes later, I did the old flip it upside down and see if it leaks everywhere test. It was thankfully totally fine though. I then made a special padded chamber for it, using a water bottle and some random foam that I found. Then, as an extra layer of protection, I then put this into another container. Now at this point, the bromine was safe and secure, but I wasn't quite done yet. I still had a bunch of dirty glassware and waste all over the table. In general, I often don't show how I cleaned everything up, but it's a major part of chemistry and it has to be taken seriously. When I was working out of the garage, this was always the worst part, and it brought back some bad memories. I just really wasn't set up to deal with waste, and cleaning my glassware in general was a huge pain. Thankfully though, this stuff was pretty easy to deal with. For the most part, I just had to neutralize things with baking soda, and then blast it with sodium thiosulfate. This destroyed all the bromine, and it made the waste much more inert. However, the problem was that it was still waste, and even though it wasn't deadly anymore, I still couldn't just pour it down the drain. 
I'll instead be taking it all with me, and storing it temporarily, and eventually giving it to a chemical waste company. But anyway, with that all dealt with, I cleaned up the garage, and I put it back to how it was. I then thanked my parents, and I very cautiously brought the bromine back to the lab. Thankfully, I was able to make it back without dying, and I guess that meant that I survived making bromine in my parents' garage. When I first came up with the idea for this video, I assumed that I'd know exactly how I felt about the whole experience the moment it was done. However, it took at least a few weeks to actually get my thoughts in order. I honestly still don't know exactly how I feel about it, but one thing that I do know for certain is that what I have now is better in almost every way, especially in terms of space and safety. I've also realized that the excitement that I thought I felt back then had very little to do with danger, and I think that danger might have actually taken away from the enjoyment. When I think about it, I actually still feel that excitement with all my projects, and in fact, I think I'm a lot more excited about the stuff that I'm doing now. I think I was just suffering from the classic problem with nostalgia, where I was only selectively remembering the good parts. After experiencing how things were, I think it's pretty clear to me that I never want to go back. I'm now even more thankful for all the support I've received over the years, and I'm really excited about what I have planned for 2021. And the first big project that I'm going to be doing is moving again. But now, with all that being said, I want to give a big thanks to all my patrons for supporting me, and to Displate for sponsoring this video. Displate's a company that sells posters, but what makes them different is that all their posters are made of metal. This makes them a lot more durable, and they're also a lot easier to set up. I'm kind of lazy, and I just lean them on stuff, but they do have a simple magnet mounting system that lets you easily put them on any wall. A couple years ago, I had them print a few of my own photos, including the one that I just mounted. Some of these can actually be seen in the intro of some of my older videos, and I've always been really impressed with the quality. They also recently sent me these much larger ones, and I'm really happy with them. These are just a few examples though, and they have about 800,000 other designs in almost all possible areas. They also offer really fast delivery, and they plant a tree in Africa for everyone that's sold. But anyway, if you're someone who's into high quality posters and art, I definitely recommend checking out Displate. If you decide to pick some up, you should also be sure to use my special link in the description. It'll give you up to 35% off, depending on how many you get. It also applies automatically at checkout, and you don't need to put in a code or anything. But with all that being said, uh, I hope you liked the video, and, and that's it. As usual, a big thanks goes out to all my supporters on Patreon. Everyone who supports me can see all my new videos at least 24 hours before I post them to YouTube. You'll also get access to all the older videos that I had to take down, and if you support me with $5 or more, you'll get your name at the end like you see here.